Alex at Carmdale Farm. We are a year three Oklahoma flower farm that sells retail market bouquets from our roadside stand. And in today's video, we are talking all about Snapdragons, how to grow them, how to make them profitable, tips and tricks, troubleshooting problems, why I think you should grow Snapdragons, all of the basic 101. So in this video, I think it would be helpful to get a piece of paper and a pencil to take some notes because I took a bunch of notes to try to make it an organized and comprehensive video for you if you want to try growing snapdragons or maybe you have tried growing snapdragons and there's been some problems along the way this would be a great video to double check like well did i grow them this way do some troubleshooting find some problems maybe to improve your snapdragons because we love snapdragons on our farm we grow them and they are profitable and they are fairly easy as you know if i were to rank the flowers we grow I would not put snapdragons near the top of most difficult. So I think they're definitely doable and to do them well on your flower farm. So let's talk about them. Before we launch in, I do wanna thank our Patreon members. We launched our Patreon in early August. We have like over 70 members now, which is just so wonderful. We made a video about why we started Patreon. You can watch that if you would like, but it's a way for us to continue our content here on YouTube because it does take a lot of time to produce YouTube videos. And so those of you on Patreon that sign up support all of you getting free YouTube videos, which is a blessing. But then on the Patreon side, we have been able to produce some exclusive videos, some great behind the scenes information, way more details about our profitable part-time operation that we have on our farm to share with Patreon. We've done some live Q and A's answering all the questions that were submitted. So it's a really great community over there. And so after watching this video, or if you know our channel in general and you're interested in diving deeper, Patreon could be a great option for you. And so I'll put that link in the description. But in this video, we're gonna talk all about Snapdragons. Snapdragons, I think, are very tricky for newer growers, mainly because Snapdragons are divided into groups. And the groups, other flowers can be divided into groups like Lysianthus, for example, but the groups mean different things and how you treat them when you plant them and grow them matter for your success. So I wanna start here in the video talking about what the different groups are, what they mean, and that's gonna help you decide when you need to start certain seeds, when you, when you need to plant them, and how to do your crop planning. Then we'll get into how to grow them well, how to harvest, how to condition, and then some bouquet recipes. And at the end of the video, I also asked um, people in our private Facebook group for questions about snapdragons and for anything I might not have covered, we'll kind of tackle that at the end with some of those questions that were submitted. So snapdragons are divided into four groups. The groups can have a little bit of overlap, but not a ton. And it's group one, two, three, and four. Sometimes you can combine a two and three Sometimes you can combine a group three and four, but what these groups are referring to is the day, the day length and the temperature toleration of that particular Snapdragon variety. And so some Snapdragon varieties, they want shorter days, they want cool temperatures to bloom well. Other Snapdragon groups want longer days and they want the summer heat. And so if you're planting some of these groups at the wrong time, you're gonna get a very poor performance out of your Snapdragons. And that might be what has happened for some of you where you don't understand why you had really thin stems or they bloomed really short or the, the bud itself was really spread out or it just didn't grow at all for you, it didn't bloom at all for you, likely comes down to a group problem. So going over, I'm going to look at my phone a lot because I have my notes here to stay organized for you guys. But group one, I'm going to give you some of the names so that it's familiar so you're not having to like figure out, well, what is a madam butterfly? What group, is it? what group is it? We're going to talk about it. So group one is the one that likes the shortest days and the coldest. And so a group one snapdragon is going to be planted in the fall and it's going to bloom in late winter. And a variety example for group one would be Maryland series. So like if you go on Johnny Seeds or Farmer Bailey or other Geo Seeds, other places you get seeds, the Maryland series is a group one. Group two is going to be 
Chantilly, Madam Butterfly, which can flex a little bit to group three, like we talked about a little bit of overlap, and Costa. Those are group two Snapdragons. That means they still want shorter days, but they're probably gonna bloom for you in early, mid spring. So they still want cooler temperatures. They don't want those warmer, later spring into summer temperatures, but they're not necessarily going to be your first blooming variety like Maryland would be. So that's group two. Group three, like I said, you could include Madam a little bit in that, but they still want cooler temperatures. Group three and four would be Potomac, Rocket, and Opus series of Snapdragons. So they want longer days and they like the heat, they need the heat to do well. And so those are gonna bloom for you in summer when the days are longer and the heat picks up. Now this is where it gets important to know your own climate because we can just say like late winter, spring, and summer, but depending on what your temperatures look like in your region, it might not perfectly fit a calendar. So for example, Potomac blooms for us in May and June. Technically, June doesn't start until June 21st-ish, but because in Oklahoma we get warm so quickly, we have a very warm April and then we really get warm in May, our Potomacs are getting that heat that they want and they're very happy and so we get them blooming. I wanna say our first Potomac bloomed third week of May and then into June. So that's technically not summer, but our temperatures are giving them the heat that they want. So that's when it's important to know your region. When I say early spring, summer, I'm really also talking about temperatures, not just like straight calendar. So that's the groups. And we're gonna be referencing this throughout the video of deciding when to plant things and your timing in your crop plan because your first reference point is going to have to be these groups. An example would be if you are in a cooler place, like you don't live in Florida, if you're starting Potomac Snapdragon seeds now with the goal to overwinter them, that is not gonna go well for you because they don't like short days they don't tolerate cold well. It's gonna take an incredibly long time from like an October plant to getting the heat that they want in May of trying to keep them alive. So they're gonna be stunted, they're gonna be stressed, they're not gonna be top quality. You don't wanna overwinter Potomac. The same would be if in March, you're starting and planting out a group one Snapdragon thinking it's going to bloom in June. It is not going to because it wants shorter days, it's want cooler temperatures, and instead what's gonna be happening is you're gonna be warming up into summer. So they're gonna be stunted, they're gonna be stressed, they're not gonna be doing well. And so it's really important that you match the group and variety to the timing that you're planting these Snapdragons in order to have the most success and the most premium bloom. It's really the first place you need to start is sorting through the varieties, whether it's seed you already bought, or plugs and seeds you're going to buy and schedule in your crop plan. You need to get that right, that's the first step. So that's the group thing. I know it can be a bit of a mystery, but hopefully that explanation was pretty good. So now let's talk about growing. You've determined correctly the groups. You know what series you wanna grow and when you need to plant them and stuff. So let's talk about starting the seeds. We buy plugs from Farmer Bailey so I'm not starting the seeds, I'm just ordering them to be delivered when I wanna plant them out. But if I were starting them from seed, you wanna start those seeds about six weeks before your plant date. So you figure out, I wanna plant Madam Butterfly Group 2 Snapdragons out in my field November 1st. You need to then back that up six weeks, that's when you would start your, your seeds to create your own plugs. And you wanna plant about two to three seeds per cell. They live very happily together, multiple snapdragons, which is great for field efficiency, especially for those of us with smaller operations. You can actually get a lot more stems than just one per cell. It also helps a little bit with germination because sometimes it can be tricky. And so if you're planting like three seeds per cell and you only get two germinate, it's like, that's great. You still have two in a cell versus one. And then you're dealing with a lot of gaps. Okay, so two to three seeds per cell, six weeks before you wanna plant out. 
and you're going to be doing six inch spacing. Some growers like to even do four inch spacing. We always use six inch, but four is definitely possible. You might get perhaps a little bit of a smaller stem or bloom because they are tighter together, but I've also seen people successfully plant them closer to four inches. We're gonna stick with six inches, but four could be maybe something you experiment with to say you're gonna do two thirds of them at six inches and then do part of the row four inches to observe. You could try that out and see what they look like for you. When to plant them. So this is going back to the groups. So if you want to overwinter snapdragons, you need to plant them out with enough time for them to get some root development. That doesn't necessarily have to be before last frost because those cool groups, groups one and two, they can handle down to about 26, 28 degrees. So they're going to be fine. You will talk about how to cover and overwinter them and stuff, but you don't have to necessarily wait until after last frost to get them out. But you also, if you stay really warm until your last frost, you have to remember they don't want the heat. So it's a little bit tricky of depending on where you live, what do your temperatures look like, where your daytime temperatures are cool, but they're typically above freezing, so you can be getting some good root development into your plugs that you planted out for them to kind of get settled into their new home, but not planting them out so early that they're really stressed by, you know, 80 degree fall days. They're really not gonna like that. You wanna be looking at like, seven like 60s 50s for the daytime temps so they can get some good root development for us we are planting group two in early november so we will have had our first frost which is mid-october but we get those 50 to 60 degree days pretty much through thanksgiving into the beginning of december and so i know that they're going to be getting some good root development if we get like a 25 degree night I can pop over some frost cloth to help with that, but they're gonna be able to settle in before we get into like deep winter cold. So that's when to plant out, which means there's still time. This video is coming out at the end of September, so there's time for a lot of you to get seeds started or to order plugs and get them delivered and get them rooted in before all of us like really get into cold winter, unless I guess maybe you're in like zone three or four, but I don't, I don't know that chilly world very well. So you've now planted them and let's talk about frost protection. So I said they're tolerant to about 26, 28 degrees. I don't like to risk things because you spend a lot of money and time and you want it to work out. So I tend to not try to gamble and push the limit as much as possible. So when I'm looking at the forecast, if it's going to be colder than 28 degrees, I'm going to cover with our frost cloth. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that they will be stronger and hardier, much colder than that, but I'm still gonna cover them and do what I can to keep them happy because I made that investment into the seed starting time or the plug costs, all of that. And so we use wire hoops, it's like a gauge wire, spool that Eric buys from like a Lowe's or a Home Depot and we cut it so that it can bend over our rows and then we use a frost cloth and then we tend to use clips to clip it to the hoops with sandbags on the end to kind of create that low tunnel over them. That's what we use and so if it's going to drop below 28 we cover and then when it's going to be above 30 we uncover because we want it getting full light, we want the daytime warmth, we want that fresh air on them for them to be growing. And so if you're overwintering flowers, it is going to be a lot of on off, on off, unless you know you, you have a couple days where it just like barely gets above freezing and you feel more comfortable leaving them covered, that's fine. But we're out there pretty much every day throughout the winter, opening something, closing something, covering something. So you want to be committed to that effort. If you're not, or you're gonna be traveling a lot or not home a lot, it might be better to not try tackling overwintering snapdragons and flowers in general and go for an early spring planting of a different group or maybe have a little bit of a different crop plan if you can't commit that to over the winter because it would suck to start seeds now, plant them out 
early November and then kill them in January because you went to Hawaii for a week and they died in a storm. <laughs> so you want, you want to plan ahead and think about what your realistic schedule looks like for overwintering. Okay, so you've correctly kept them alive all winter with your low tunnels and your frost cloth. You need to net your snapdragons. This is like a non-negotiable 100% must for snapdragons. Snapdragons are what are called geotropic, which means they grow with gravity. They're not, um, they don't follow the sun necessarily. So if they bend, they're going to then re-straighten themselves, but it's gonna be kind of like a funky shape to get them growing back up straight. And you're not gonna be able to straighten that again. So you have a snowstorm or there's a windstorm or there's a hard rain and things get bent. It's not going to be able to recover properly with a straight stem that you want for cut flower sales. So you need to have netting. It's You're planting at six inches. You can buy the six inch Hordanova netting, put them over T posts or wooden stakes. It's super easy to net things. You just need to do it and you need to be disciplined in doing it. You need to put it on the schedule and not let them get too tall and get it done. We don't put our stakes and our netting up at planting because they're still so tiny, especially when we're overwintering and they're gonna go dormant for a bit. They're just not gonna need the netting for a little while. But when they start getting to that first level of netting that we like to use, typically at about eight, about 10 inches, we get that netting on. And then as they grow taller, instead of adding layers, what we prefer to do is just kind of like scooch the netting up as they grow to give them that support. But you might find that you prefer to leave a first layer and then just add a second layer on top. That works as well, but you have to net. And there's so many times I see pictures of people snapdragon rows or they're having snapdragon problems and there's no netting and they're just like flopped over and they're bent or they're wacky. It's just really a non-negotiable. And so you need to net them. And the next thing to do is to decide to pinch or not to pinch snapdragons. There are pros and cons for both choices. We are pro no pinch. So I guess con, we're anti, we're anti pinch would be the way to put it. And the reason being, if you do not pinch, you are gonna get the tallest stem, the thickest stem and the biggest bloom from that one seed by not pinching it. You are gonna be able to charge more money wholesale. It is gonna be a premium, more expensive flower for a retail bouquet with a bigger impact than if you pinched but you're only getting one bloom because you didn't pinch. If you pinch, depending on where you live, you can get three, four, some people even get five cuts. I've never gotten five, but three or four from a pinch. They're going to be thinner, they are going to be shorter, and the bloom is going to be smaller. So you're not gonna be able to charge as much wholesale if you sell to florists. And if you sell retail, I don't think you, you can charge the same price either. And it's not gonna be as impactful in your arrangement, but you will get more cuts. And so some growers I know will have sections that they don't pinch for the reasons I listed. And then they'll have another section in their row or field where they will pinch. And part of that is because it works as it's a succession in it of itself, because the non-pinched ones are gonna set bud and bloom sooner than the pinched ones because they have to recover and regrow. And so if you planted them all out at once and say you pinched half and didn't pinch half, you've kind of self staggered them already. And you can use them for different purposes or charge differently, that sort of thing. I prefer the tall, thick, premium stem Snapdragon to the pinched ones. I just think the quality, the specialty-ness of it looks a lot better but you have to decide, and maybe it's worth trialing, what you like better of the pinch or not pinching. I've done both, so I've, I've seen in person both, and I prefer not to pinch and just grow more snapdragons if I'm needing to hit a certain number. But typically you wanna pinch your snapdragons when they're about, maybe about four inches, and you wanna pinch and leave a couple sets of leaves for them. 
Some people like to pinch them in their seed trays. If you do that, you pinch them, but then you need to let them live in the trays for a couple more weeks to kind of recover and get going again. Alternatively, you could plant a smaller plug out in the field, let it grow to that four or five inches, and then pinch in the field, and just make sure you're giving it a lot of water and you know you don't have like a deep, deep freeze coming that's gonna really stress them as they're trying to reroute and get going again. But that's the size that you, the size of the plug height that you want to pinch. Someone had asked in the questions if it's worth it to um, root the cuttings, because you can. Um, I think it kind of depends on your situation. So like big commercial farms are not gonna do that because it actually just would be more expensive for them from a labor and a material standpoint. They're not gonna do that. They're just gonna pinch and toss it and move on. If you're a smaller operation, that is a good way economically to get more plants. So you'll want to pinch them and dip them in rooting powder and then put them into a new plug tray, water them in, and then baby them for a couple weeks until they root in and then you can plant those out and they'll be true to their mother plant that you pinched them from. I did that our first year because we had the space, I was still learning, we weren't as big as we are now and so I wanted to go through that experiment and see what it was like and it totally worked and they went wonderful. So if you're a smaller operation, I think that could be an option. We wouldn't do that now because we're growing thousands and thousands of them and I don't want to go through the labor of pinching and rooting and the soil and the lights and the plant. I just, it's easier for me to buy another $50 plug tray if I want 200 more Snapdragon plugs than to go through that process. So you kind of have to decide, is it worth it with your time and budget and scale if that really makes sense to do? And it could be yes or no, depending on your situation. But you've decided if you want to pinch or not pinch. Now we can talk about fertilizer. So snapdragons definitely benefit from fertilizer. You don't want to fertilize them too much in the winter because they do kind of go through a little bit of a stagnant dormancy period because it is winter and it is pretty cold. If you're planting in early spring and they're not experiencing that, you don't need to do that weight. You can plant them out, give them a good water, let them get going and growing. And then what we do is we would give them a weekly foliar feed fertilizer. And so we use Neptune's Harvest. It's that seaweed fish emulsion. We put it in our automatic pump sprayers so that it's a liquid and we're spraying the leaves down once a week and it's giving them that boost of growth and they really benefit from it. And so we try to be disciplined on our fertilizer schedule. I might even fertilize them early on for a winter planting and then back off in like December and January. And then towards the end of February, when we're getting a bit warmer and they're starting to really wake up again and put on growth, I will resume the um, fertilizer. Similar thing that I would do like ranunculus and anemones. When they plant, get them going, they kind of go dormant a bit in winter, then they start ramping up again in February into March and they start getting fertilizer Again, so yes on fertilizing snapdragons. And then last bit for the growing and the planting is succession planting. So because it's typically one bloom and done, or if you pinch, you're getting a couple and that's it, you wanna succession plant snapdragons so you can extend the season that you have them. Because if you remember the groups, you can't have an infinite amount of one group for a very long period of time because you're entering into the next group or the next um, season. And so you can only succession plant Madam Butterfly for so long before it would start getting too warm and they wouldn't perform well. So my recommendation for succession planting would be like three weeks, maybe four weeks between a plant. So you could do like November 1st, Madam Butterfly, December 1st, <clears throat> excuse me, December 1st, Madam Butterfly. And then in theory, you know, the first round blooms mid-March, and then maybe two, three weeks later, that next one blooms, and then the Madam Butterfly season is over, and you're into a new group of snapdragons that you've hopefully also succession planted. So you really do actually have to spend some time thinking about your crop plan here 
for Snapdragons to have a continual amount because you're not just working within the flower Snapdragon, but you need to be looking at the groups and then when in that succession plan you need to switch to the next group. So a, a real life example for us is Madam Butterfly November 1st. You could do it again December 1st, take a break, end of February, early March, we plant out group three, Potomac's, and then I plant out it again, end of March. And so that's my succession planting where I should have Snapdragons early May through June because of that. But I've crossed over groups and succession planted within, within those groups. I hope that's making, making sense on how to do that. And some of it is just hands-on experience too. You just kind of have to try and observe. But your biggest problem is going to be if you're succession planting too, too long for a group, meaning you're trying to get Madam Butterfly to bloom in June, not going to happen. Or you're trying to overwinter and succession plant Potomac's, that's not going to work either because they don't want to be cold. So you got to get that group right and then start building out your quantities from there. So you've figured out your crop plan, you got your succession planting, you've overwintered them, you've fertilized them, you've pinched them, you've netted them. Let's talk about the harvesting and conditioning and some pest troubleshooting because you've, you've grown your snapdragons now, so what happens? So when to harvest? You want to harvest snapdragons when about half of the spike is open and blooming. You can, can, you can harvest when it's like three quarters open, but what you're fighting against a bit is the bumblebees. And so once a bumblebee or any bee, whatever, pollinates a bloom and they're so cute, you know, you see them snuggle up in there and you see their little bee butts and it's cute. But once it's been pollinated, it's going to be a day or two and that bloom is going to fall off. And you've probably seen pictures where like the tips of a snapdragon will be blooming and then it kind of has these like pollen spikes all down the bottom. Those are all blooms that have been pollinated and falling off. And so you're trying to beat the bees. So you don't want to harvest too early where there's no color on the buds or none of them have opened up. But if you wait too late, you're affecting the vase life and the quality of that Snapdragon for your florist or your customer. So I try to get them when like one or two buds have opened up. And that, some, depending on how big the bloom is, that's getting close to the halfway point. That's when you want to harvest. You want to harvest a deep cut, so a long stem. Long stems you can charge more for. They look more premium and beautiful. Give it a good hard cut. And you want to strip all the leaves off of it. It's really easy to do in Snapdragons. They strip really easily. And that's because then all the energy that the plant still has and is going to have in your harvest bucket is going to main, be maintaining the bloom and not the leaves. So strip all the leaves for harvesting and then you want to bunch them. Depending, you know, if depending on how organized you are, it would be smart to bunch them in a logical number. So like bunches of 10, bunches of five sort of thing. But you want to bunch them, which means you rubber band them collectively together. And you want to put them in your harvest bucket and you want to be harvesting snapdragons into your tallest buckets that you have. So think like a kitty litter bucket, a Lowe's five gallon bucket, those tall buckets, because we talked about how snapdragons are geotropic, where they're gonna bend. They, just like a sunflower, they're gonna bend so easily in a bucket if they're not supported. And so you wanna be harvesting a full, tight, straight bucket where they just look like packed in little soldiers so they can't go anywhere so you don't have them leaning and then you come the next day and they've developed a droop or the tips have drooped because they were at a bit of an angle you want them to be as upright as possible and so trying to harvest full buckets and bunching them tight together really help with that or if you can't finding a way to keep them propped up straight in your bucket. It, you're gonna put them in your cooler, whether that's like a commercial walk-in cooler or just like a Facebook fridge, you wanna store them in a cooler. They like temperatures between 34 and 38, 
but they will freeze. So if your cooler is not super reliable or it fluctuates a bit, you want to aim more towards the 38 than the 34 when it might drop down to freezing. But that's about the temperature you want to go for and you want to hold them in a holding solution. And so we use Crystal number two, um, which is a holding solution. And that just gives them more of the, like the food and the water situation to keep them happy in the cooler until you're ready to sell them. How long you can hold them in the cooler is a little bit subjective. Some people say no more than a couple days for the absolute premium vase life of that Snapdragon. I have held up to five days and felt that the Snapdragon still performed well in a retail market bouquet and it lasted well for the customer, but that's assuming that you haven't harvested past its prime, the blooms are all blown open, they've been pollinated, that's not gonna hold for five days. But if it's been harvested correctly, bunched, upright, in holding solution, only one or two rows of buds are open, I push it closer to five days. So like a Tuesday harvested flower, I would put in a Saturday bouquet. But you need to be really mindful about the accuracy of your harvest when you decide what the appropriate holding time would be. If I cut things that are a bit on the later end, let's say on Tuesday, I would try to use them and sell them earlier, like Wednesday or Thursday. So you can still sell them and make money on them, but not try to push the envelope and then run into quality problems. So that's, that's the harvesting. Let's talk about pest pressure and issues with snapdragons. So the main issues with snapdragons are going to be aphids, thrips, and what's called rust on the leaves. We, I, we've never had rust. Um, typically you deal with rust or fungal issues with like a copper fungicide. So you could research that and look into that schedule and application rates if maybe that is going to be a problem for you or if you've experienced that. And then they also are susceptible to aphids and thrips. I wish I had like a simple do this and you'll never have that problem again, but that's not true, especially with those little boogers that are so hard to get rid of. The, the pressure is a lot harder in our tunnel than in the field for those bugs. But typically when we start seeing bug activity, we start a pyrethrin schedule and a spray maintenance schedule to try to stay on top of them. If a particular Snapdragon just really gets infested with aphids or thrips, instead of trying to fight it, we pull that whole plant and we burn it. We get it out of the field and destroyed to kind of cut back on that very aggressive adult egg larva life cycle that these bugs have. It is better to lose a couple plants than to be just dumping chemicals after chemicals trying to kill them all. Meanwhile, they're laughing at you and spreading everywhere. And so kind of get mentally comfortable with the idea of pulling plants and disposing of them. Um, yeah, it can feel a bit painful, but it's actually way better than while you're trying to kill them, they're multiplying like crazy. Um, but I would also just, I would suggest doing some deep dives, especially over the winter into pest management. There's a lot of great resources, especially in extension offices of how to deal with some of this that would be a lot you know, harder to encapsulate in just a quick YouTube video here. But you'll be wanting to look into how to manage aphids and thrips. And always the best management is staying on top of it rather than dealing with an infestation. It's really hard to, to get around that. Also troubleshooting. People have complained about thin stems, spread out blooms on the stalk and crooked stems. And so the biggest indicators, well, for crooked stems is you didn't net correctly. Thin stems often come down to planting the wrong group at the wrong time and or the plants just being very stressed, whether it was drought or overwatering, their feet stayed wet for too long in the winter, or you had just like horrible storms and they just really got their butt kicked over winter 
they're just going to be really stressed and give you poor quality. And some of that stuff you can't control, some of it you can. For example, we had a wonderful Snapdragon season, but we realized in our row that spring is very wet for us. And the south end of our annual field was getting much wetter than the north end. And so naturally, the, it was like a progression of quality and the snapdragons that were at higher ground and didn't stay as wet were absolutely perfect and premium. And then the ones that were staying boggy and wet threw up lame, thin, stressed blooms. And so that was a watering issue for us that we needed to deal with. Same with our overwintered snapdragons. They just, it was the right group. We planted Madame and Chantilly. It was okay to overwinter them, but we had some horrible arctic, multi-week, crazy cold, and it just was really hard with only low tunnels to keep them not stressed. And I think that's why they ended up giving us less quality than the ones were in our tunnel, just because of environmental. So that's something to consider if that's what you're exper experiencing. You might need to check water and also the timing of when you're planting things um, and making it maybe f a full fall plant over winter is not for you. And it would be better to plant early February and not have to, you know, get them through December and January snowstorms and that sort of thing. So that would be my advice if that's what you're experiencing with snapdragons. I have to take a drink. I'm very pregnant, as you can see. So I probably sound very out of breath, like I'm running a marathon, but because I don't feel like I have full lung capacity going on. But let's talk about our favorite varieties. So we don't grow all the varieties. We've grown a lot of the varieties and I've narrowed down what's the favorite for us. That might be completely different for you. If you're in a Northern climate, you might get a different performance out of a different variety than I would and vice versa. Maybe I just can grow a lot better Potomacs than a very cold place because we just get the heat that they love. So you'll want to play around, but we love in group two, we don't grow any group one, but we love in group two, the Costa series. Great colors, looks a bit like a Potomac in its shape, but it blooms first for us is on the earlier end. We love Costa. You could do a mix, you can do straight colors. I haven't decided on the colors we're gonna do yet, but I did a mix last year and they all did beautifully. It's just, you know, when you get a mix, you get some colors that just maybe don't fit quite the palette you want. So this year, instead of doing a mix, I'm gonna pick straight colors, but absolutely loved Costa. I'm gonna be planting them in February um, and January. I'm not gonna do them in the, in the fall planting, but, and they'll bloom in April for us, but I loved Costa. Um, and then for the group three and four, so these are the warmer guys, we love Potomac. We plant those out in our field. We don't need to put them in the tunnel because they're gonna, I'm planting them at the correct time. So they're gonna get the warmth. They don't need, I'm planting them like early March time frame. So there's, they're not gonna need much row cover unless we get like a freak night or two where you know they need some frost cloth. They're not having to be overwintered so they can go out in the, the field. They don't need premium tunnel space. I absolutely love Potomac. I love all the colors. They're incredible. Can't wait to look at the catalog and pick out our colors for next year. But we're gonna grow a lot of Potomacs and I'm probably gonna do like three plantings of them in that kind of three week stagger succession that I talked about. We overwintered Madam Butterfly in the field this year. Well, I guess I planted them last year technically. I'm not gonna overwinter field snapdragons this year. It was way too high of labor. I talked about how they got stressed in our storms, all of that. So I've carved out premium space in our tunnel and I'm gonna try Madam again, overwintered, but in our tunnel because I think that'll fix the water problem and it'll keep them a little more snuggy cold, or not snuggy cold, snuggy warm in the tunnel and maybe their performance will be better because Madam Butterfly is a beautiful form. It looks different than Costa and Potomac in the bloom. And so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna plant it in early November and hope to have it bloom probably late March, early April. And then the Costa will bloom and then the Potomac will bloom. 
So those are our favorite varieties. We grew Chantilly. I did not like it. It struggled because of the overwinter stuff, which is a grower problem, but just the form itself, I didn't like. It was very thin and the buds on it were very spaced out. And that is its form. It's not like I did something wrong there. I just realized I didn't like it. I like the fatter buds, the closer together, like the chunkier looking look, whereas this one felt just a bit more wispy and not as interesting. So I'm not gonna do Chantilly anymore just as a preference. So to recap, Costa, Potomac, and a retry on uh, Madam Butterfly. Opus and Maryland are very highly rated. I just, I'm not gonna grow them. I don't need early Maryland ones. I don't have the tunnel space for them anyways. And because I'm so happy with Potomac, I don't really feel like adding another variety with Opus with a, a group three, four. Just don't need it. I'm gonna stick with what I know, but I've heard great things. And there was one, it's slipping my mind now. I just remember, Rocket. Rocket is a heat loving group three, four, I just didn't like it, a bit like Chantilly. It grew fine, it loves the heat. You'd plant it at the same time as Potomac. I just didn't like the colors and I just, it didn't perform as well as the Potomac. So I cut Rocket out. It's a cheaper seed. I think it's because it looks like a less impressive flower. And so I'm sticking with Potomac for heat loving and not doing Rocket. But again, it's worth trialing some of these and preferentially you might prefer something that I don't and that is just fine. All right, bouquet recipes. I'll put some pictures on the screen of how we use them. So if you're new to our farm, we are very low filler. Our bouquets are mixed for retail, but they're usually only two to four flowers in the recipe, sometimes five if I'm feeling crazy, sometimes just straight bunches. And so we don't grow a lot of filler and we don't have very complicated recipes. And so I looked back in some of our pictures, and I used, I wish I had Snapdragons longer. So in year four, I am gonna work really hard on a succession plan so that I can extend our use of Snapdragons. But I use them primarily in three different recipes and I'll share them here with you. The first one was when we had our Madam Butterflies blooming at the same time as our Ranunculus were here at the end of March, early April. And that recipe I absolutely loved. It was six Ranunculus and three Snapdragons. I know that sounds super simple, but I mean, if you're looking at the picture, I hope you think it looks beautiful. I loved making the bouquets. They were super easy and efficient, but they also just looked absolutely beautiful with the mixed colors and the delicate specialty ranunculus that are round and swirly with the spike of the Snapdragon. I loved that recipe. The next recipe I saw that I used was when our sunflower field was really starting to get going in May. So this would have been Potomac Snapdragons with our early sunflowers. And we did seven sunflowers and four Snapdragons. Again, super simple, but the yellow, the, I think we had gold light at the time, gold light and gold and uh, white night, no white light, white light, gold light of those lighter sunflower colors and the chartreuse face and the white face with the pastel Snapdragons just screamed bright, cheery, spring, early summer to me. I really liked that bouquet. And then we also had a recipe that was five sunflowers, three snapdragons, and two bupleurum that were blooming in May. And I also liked that as well. Bupleurum is kind of one of the only fillers that we grow because it's hard for us to have early May flowers and bupleurum will bloom. And so we grow that so that we have stems and I liked them in that recipe. And we're probably gonna do the exact same thing next year. Our crop plan from a variety list is not changing next year. I'm dropping one flower, adding another one. We'll do a video about it. But it's not changing a lot. I'm just growing maybe some different colors and a larger quantity to meet our growing demand. So these recipes will likely stay the same next year, just hopefully more with more customers that we're building. So that's my like 101 Snapdragon spiel. And I have here some follower questions from Facebook that I put here that I was assuming maybe I wouldn't necessarily cover in the overview. So we'll go over them over them here. And maybe these are questions you guys are thinking of right now. So the first one is, is there a difference in tunnel and field Snapdragons? My answer is yes and no. 
The overwintered Snapdragons, absolutely. The tunnel ones were perfection. They were giant monsters. They were beautiful. The field ones were stressed struggle sallies from having to survive all winter. That was a big difference. Can I grow a better tunnel Potomac than a field Potomac? Probably not. The timing of the Potomac planting in the field with getting warmer produced just as beautiful of a snapdragon as the early ones were in the tunnel. So I would answer that based on when you're trying to grow. If you're overwintering and you're trying for the earlier end of spring snapdragons, the tunnel ones are gonna be way better. But for summer snapdragons, I wouldn't use tunnel premium space at that point. I'd have them in the field and they're going to do just fine. And that's our plan. So yes, yes and no there. Someone asked, when do we fall plant? I answered that we plant in early November here. Oklahoma, 7A, last frost, October 15th, but we stay pretty warm in November. So we still get good root, root growth. So that's when our snapdragons are planting. We talked about rooting the, the clippings. I, I do wanna add, if you decide to pinch and root them, they need to be planted out a couple weeks later. You can't just like root them and save them for a couple months and then plant. They're gonna be ready as plugs to plant after a couple weeks and they need to go out. So you can't hold them for a long extended amount of time. They just would be kind of like a partial succession plant a couple weeks later. So you need to be prepared and have a place for them to go in a couple weeks later. You can't like pinch and root in November and say, well, I'll plant them in January because they're gonna grow pretty fast in those plug trays with the rooting hormone and everything. How to prevent crooked stems. We talked about you have to net. If you are still having crooked stems, you need to be doing multiple layers. If you're still having crooked stems, then it's likely an environmental problem and you need to not have field snapdragons. You need to have tunnel snapdragons to keep them even more buffeted from whatever is knocking them over and causing them not to be straight. But typically netting is enough to solve, to solve a crooked stem problem. Soil condition, nothing fancy. We don't do anything fancy. We do a soil test. All of, we make sure that all of our fields have balanced numbers. We add compost and we till and rake and we plant into it. They don't need any special pH or special fussing. We're doing the weekly foliar feeds. They're getting extra nutrition. Our soil is quality anyways, but they're just getting that extra boost. And that's all we do. We're not doing anything else fancy to our soil. Seed starting issues. So we don't start any of our seeds anymore. I've grown snapdragons from seed. I prefer plugs because it's just easier on my life. But I'm going to link in the description um, resources for seed starting problems from people that are just better qualified to explain and maybe walk you through some germination issues or maybe the conditions that snapdragons like because they can be a little tricky to germinate. So I'll link that in the description for you guys to continue deep diving snapdragons. <laughs> so I know seed starting is always, always a little bit tricky. Oh, this one I did not get to, a couple more questions. What do you do with them once they are done blooming? Do I let them reflush or do I flip the beds? So this goes back to what I said with the groups. If you're growing, for example, group two, Madam Butterfly, you are done cutting them in early April, that's not going to reflush because by the time for us, that by the, by the time that would be reflushing, it would be early June, that's gonna be way too hot for them. They're not going to reflush. So a group one, a group two, the cool flower, the cool weather loving, snapdragons, I, we flip the bed. We pull them out or we cut them down and we till and then we plant summer annuals and we move on. Now a group three, four heat loving. So I plant a Potomac in early March. It blooms early June. You can try leaving it and letting it reflush for say maybe in August. I don't need to do that because of our, we have enough space and we close in August. I don't want that reflush. I tend to think they don't, they're not as great and it's not worth it. So I prefer not to leave them and to reflip and either plant sunflowers or something else there, maybe another succession of zinnias, do something with them instead of letting them reflush. 
but because summer and the heat is so much longer, you could try with a warmer Snapdragon, letting it reflush and see if you like the outcome. But I think typically it's better to just flip the bed and move on to your next season and planting in succession for your next season. I don't typically like to leave things to reflush. Like we don't do that for Lysianthus, for example. We cut, we're done, we flip, we move on. There's no sitting and getting full of weeds and bugs and continuing to water and hoping they reflush. That's just not what we've prioritized. And then the last question was, how do you get snapdragons all spring and summer long? That succession planting with the groups. So my advice would be to sit down right now because this is a good time being end of September. Figure out, do you wanna overwinter snapdragons? If so, you need to identify which group one or two that you want to do and when you need to have them planted out. So do you need to start seeds tomorrow or get that order in or order plugs, get your start getting your beds ready when you need to have them planted out and then stagger three weeks to a month from that first planting. Do it all again of group one and two and then move on to group three and four of what you wanna grow, how many and when they need to get in the ground. Let's say March 1st, put it on a calendar back it up six weeks to start seeds or order plugs for delivery March 1st. And then three to four weeks after that, you do it again within the group three and four, and maybe even do it again three or four weeks later in groups three or four. And that should get you snapdragons for three, four months in a row. And that's a really good length of time to be having snapdragons. So I hope this video was helpful. I will put helpful Snapdragon resources if you wanna to continue to deep dive. I'll put in some seed starting struggle tips. If you're interested in our Patreon, which includes even more detail and our pricing of, of flowers and our crop plan and helpful downloads and Q and A's and all this extra fun stuff that we really like doing over there, I will put that link in the description. But I hope this was a helpful video for snapdragons and maybe solved some of the mystery that I know it can be and maybe troubleshooted for you some of the problems you've had with snapdragons, but it is possible to grow them really well and beautifully once you sort out some of the trickiness that they are. But thanks guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.